We're so glad you're here. We welcome every person of goodwill, just as you are, no matter your age, what body you inhabit, whatever, whomever you love, whatever are your spiritual beliefs, you're welcome here. We invite everyone to join us for coffee, treats, and conversation after the service, both in person and on Zoom. For the folks on Zoom, you'll find the order of service and the song lyrics in the chat. Linnea Shannon is our Zoom host today. I'm sure we're all aware that this area from Lake Wenatchee through Leavenworth down the Wenatchee River and across the Columbia River to this ground right here is the ancestral land of the Pascosa or Wenatchee people. From time immemorial, the Pascosa have been stewards of this land, fishing, hunting, gathering plants for medicine and food, and practicing cultural traditions. The Pascosa still live here. We acknowledge that their land has been taken over because the US government broke treaty obligations and allowed uninvited white colonizers to settle here. We stand alongside our indigenous neighbors as they continue their traditions and seek to have their rights recognized. And we actively promote and contribute to their land back efforts. The chalice and flame symbolize our congregation gathered in principles and faith. It's an image of our spirituality and our religion. If you at home have your chalice with you, please join us now in lighting it. Here in the sanctuary, we will speak these lighting words written uh, in unison. They're either found in your order of service or on the screen. And Thomas will light the candle, the chalice. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. To lead you into silent meditation, I have a spoken meditation, a metta meditation by the Vietnamese Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become wholly ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being common to us all and to all living things. In this moment, in each breath and between us all, evoking the presence of the great compassion, let us fill our hearts with our own compassion. Compassion towards ourselves, towards those beside us, towards all living beings. Let us pray that we ourselves cease to be, cease to be the cause of suffering to any other. With humility, with awareness of the existence of life, awareness of the suffering that goes on always around us, let us practice the establishment of peace, deep peace in our hearts and on earth. In silence, let us pray or meditate as our hearts call us.
talking about love and fantastic events and gathering of friends, I went to the nonprofit day at Pibus yesterday. And I went because, you know, it's a thing I was supposed to do and I was supposed to see my people there at the table and then I thought I'd leave kind of quickly. And instead I got into all these conversations, these conversations with wonderful people who are really passionate about doing good things for other people without being paid for it. <laughs> That's really cool. It was inspiring and encouraging. It's a striking moment in the story that that uh, Chris shared. It's bef it, before the story, before Jesus tells the story, and I liked her little interpretation of Jesus. Nice guy, good teacher. <laughs> Different theologies people have about Jesus. But Jesus is asked by a lawyer who are not well respected in the, in the scriptures. He's asked by a lawyer, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, using the Socratic method, asks, well, what's written in the law? How do you read the law? And the answer is, love God with all your heart and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I've always thought about this. If you're going to love God with all your heart and mind, then how do you fit in your neighbor and yourself? And obviously, yourself and your neighbor must be part of whatever God is. And Jesus responds to this, love God and love yourself and love your neighbor with, you're right, do this, you shall live. This is the core of Unitarian theology. This is the core of Universalist theology, this passage in which Jesus does not say, believe in me as a deity, does not say, believe in uh, the power of the scriptures. He just focuses on the divine, which is a mystery always, mystery beyond understanding, and the way it is present in human relationships. But the man, the lawyer, wanting to get all the details down, asks, well, so who's my neighbor? And Jesus responds with a story about an ass, outcast foreigner. The, 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 in many places, the Samaritans were not simply I mean, they were a breakaway sect, and they were often hated or feared because there had been literal violence. And we know about uh, ethnic, racial, political violence in the Middle East. It has continued for a long time, but it was very clear at that time when he said a Samaritan, he wasn't just saying, oh, just anybody. And so often it's good for us if you really want to understand the story to think about something that someone that makes you uncomfortable Perhaps it's a street person who looks like they're just uh, hanging out and causing trouble. Maybe it's someone who's a part of a political party that you don't like and think is ruining the country. You have some animosity towards this person to really understand the story. And, and uh, Jesus then tells that story about the priest who's a holy, pure person who, because of the demands of the, the ritual that he does for everyone, does not want to get uh, polluted and and same as the, the Levite too. They don't want to get involved in something, not just because they're kind of being aloof and uncaring. It's also because they don't want to mess up the thing that they're really supposed to do and forget what they're really supposed to do, <laughs> right? And then Jesus says, who, who, which of these three seem to be the neighbor to him who fell amongst the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy, love, kindness, generosity. And Jesus just says, go and do likewise. The question is, how do you get eternal life? And he says, go and do likewise, do. And this has always been at the heart of Unitarian and Universalist theology, is it matters not what we think and what we feel only, those are important, but it matters what we do in the world, how we embody the things that we value. Universalists, believed that we should do on earth as it is in heaven and heaven was without hell. There's no eternal hell. There's no eternal suffering and hatred and rejection. In the universalist theology, all human beings always forever are deserving of love and respect and inclusion and kindness and justice. And the Unitarians, I always like that story about William Channing, one of the first great preachers of Unitarianism in America. And he 
was listening to his, uh, he was sitting next to his father, listening to a sermon. Very traditional Christian sermon about hell. And he's filled with, starts to get filled with fear and horror because this preacher is telling him that he is an awful person, that everyone is awful. Everyone is depraved and deserving of judgment and hellfire, and that he might too himself be thrown into the fires of hell. And Channing's just filled as he's a little boy. He's like eight years old and he's freaking out about this. He's coming and he looks over his dad and his dad's kind of cool and calm. And then they go out and his dad starts whistling. His dad is whistling along and, and says, good preaching, Matt. You know? And Channing's thinking, there's some, some sort of disconnect because the preacher was so convicted, convinced of the evilness of human beings and the likelihood of hell and the likelihood that most people were going there. And then it just evaporates. And he's felt this disconnect between the teachings and who his dad really was and what his dad really trusted and how his father lived in the world. And Channing went on to preach more and more Unitarians, create, helping uh, the Unitarian movement form in this country. Salvation by character was the root of his theology, that our salvation is not assured by having good character, so bad character, people get thrown in hell, it's that we want to nurture our hell, our, we want to nurture our own character and confidence and goodness. And in the practice of being the best people we can be, trying to learn, falling short, trying to learn again, trying to do better, in that practice, we're already there. We've already found what we were looking for, hoping for, what the lawyer wanted it was a life that has eternal resonance. One of my colleagues told a story about how he, when he was a young, when he was a minister, middle-aged minister, he, his car broke down, just died. And he's serving a large congregation, congregation of over 300, about 300 members. And he realized that purchasing a car had suddenly become a difficult problem because it had moral connotations, ethical connotations. He said, I was soon being heavily lobbied by the Prius faction of the congregation <laughs> who felt that the only possible expression of a good and right UU character was be, would be to choose a hybrid. Others told me that if I was to be perfect, I should abandon all cars and take the bus every time, despite the fact that there wasn't good service on Sunday. For everyone, any large vehicle, David Pyle said, especially an SUV, was a spiritual anathema and great sin worthy of condemnation. And he wrote, a few of them came to me privately to tell me that they would love me no matter what I decided. <laughs> Unless, of course, I chose a sports car, then that was just wrong. <laughs> What does it mean to have good character? What does it mean to be a loving person? What does it mean to care about the earth and all the living things with whom we share this earth? And the joke uh, back at, uh, at the time of the merger in 1960 was that uh, the Universalists were the people who believed that God really is too good to damn anyone to an eternal hell, and Unitarians believe that they are all too good to ever be damned. <laughs> We struggle with judgment. I've been thinking about that. I keep thinking about how prevalent systems of judgment and fear and guilt are in human cultures and in human religions. And I used to think it was just due to bad parenting, but I now, <laughs> I now understand that we have this genetic openness, this, this structure of our brain that teaches us we need to be uh, guilty, feel embarrassed about some things. It carries, and then that gets amplified out. And our theology is really, to, is how we live. It goes deeper than thought. It's what is it that lets us love people, feel loved by other people, feel included. I've been reading articles recently about, and I was thinking about William Channing, and I've been re reading articles about the ex-evangelicals. 
people who are getting really sick of what is obviously just like William Channing felt when he was eight years old, this preaching about one thing and then acting in a different way. This lack of integrity and especially people who for decades had talked about how absolutely essential it was to have good moral character and political leaders and then have just reversed 100% and say, oh, well, it turns out God picks people who don't have good moral character to lead this country. Unitarians have always struggled with this idea of character and how do we know exactly that we have character and how do we develop it? And as that moved along, as Unitarianism moved along and became more and more involved with uh, the, the free thinkers and the, the non-theists and then the humanists and atheists, there became a deeper question about, well, what does it mean to embody virtue in your life? And for me, there was a previous teacher, hundreds of years before Jesus, who was talking about character, and that was Buddha, the Buddha, Gautama, uh, Siddhartha, you know, Gautama. And he, one of, in the, one of the most ancient Buddhist scriptures, he talks about these four, what, what he calls Brahm, the Brahma Viharas. The idea of the Brahma Vihara is, a, is actually an Indian concept. Brahma is, a, is the ultimate nameless deity, right? Brahma, or, the, or all deities, or divineness. And then uh, the viharas are homes, places where you will find the deity, you will find goodness, you'll find that transcendent, absolute goodness. And the, the ultimate of all of those Brahma viharas, the ultimate of those is loving kindness. You know, it is metta. You may have heard metta, metta, and metta is just loving kindness. It's the greatest. And the, there's a meta, um, meta meditations or just simply, may I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be at ease and safe. May I be peaceful. And then you extend it to others. And the point of this meditation is not just to kind of think about that, but to feel it. What, to what extent are you already healthy and whole and at peace and at ease? And then extending that to other people, someone sitting next to you in the meditation hall, someone in your family, someone that you're very close to that you care about, and then keep extending it and seeing how many people, how much of the world, and then carrying that with you out of the meditation into the world. How, how often, how long can you just wish wellness, kindness, safety, just want people to be that way. That's loving kindness is just wanting good things for people. And then the, the next two uh, Vihara Brahma Viharas, the next two virtues, one is compassion. So it's seeing the sadness and the suffering of other people. And it doesn't mean identifying with that suffering, but of course, going back to loving kindness, wanting people to be free of that, but not saying, oh, that person's suffering. It's bringing it in and realizing that it's part of the fabric of the world right now is the suffering. And then the other one is sympathetic joy, is to see the joy in the world that is not yours, to see the joy in, in other people, that people are happy about something and then identify that and want them to be happy and to extend that deep, not just, not just ease and health and well-being and peace, but a joyful gladness at being, to focus on all of those. And then the, the fourth virtue that helps us get through the, those, hold all those together, that's joy and sadness, love and peace is equanimity. It's the ability of your mind to go through difficult, hard moments with a certain sense of equality. This too shall pass. And then to go into joyful and glad things without clinging to them, without holding on to them, without becoming desperately grasping for the good things and the joyful things, but having a certain balance of mind. This too will pass. It's part of the wholeness. And that equanimity helps us go forward. I went, look, went looking for jokes about equanimity. And I found out that David Chappelle, David Chappelle had a comedy show titled Equanimity. 
there is literally no equanimity anywhere in, that, in his entire, I read the whole text. I went searching for the word. It's in the title. It's almost like, I'm going to get, show you what equanimity is not. And that's how I'll tell you what equanimity is. Or maybe he's just making fun of the word. He did mention religion, though, in his, in his comedy thing. He said, I respect people's beliefs. I affirm everyone's beliefs, except, he said, for the Amish. I mean, they're the ones people that I can say their God is really wrong because I was driving 75 miles down an Ohio freeway and I had to slow down for a donkey in a cart. <laughs> All the virtues have their enemies. So of loving kindness, the enemy, the opposite is hatred. And you want to dissolve hatred, you know, understand that it will rise up, but you want to do anything you can and you especially use the virtue to dissolve its enemy. But there are also near enemies. And the near enemy of loving kindness is a sort of selfish love where you love someone because they're going to give you something good, like kisses and hugs. And there's a kind of self-serving piece of that. You love this baby. I've seen babies. There's something pure about, you know, our little granddaughter's smile. Amy and I keep talking about this. How do we fall in love with someone we've never even met before? Just, it's incredible. But the, the sweetness about who she is. But there's also this sense of this is my grandchild. And I love her because she's my daughter's daughter. And there's a sort of selfish element to that. Loving kindness as an ultimate transcendent virtue is you are just automatically, unconditionally offering love and kindness. And so when you see the smile of any baby, I mean, your, your enemy's baby, somebody you don't like very much, and you see their baby smile, you may not have the same reaction as your own grandchild, right? That smile that just fills you with this, like, the world is radiating joy. She likes me. But you see someone else and you may not have that same reaction. And what the, the virtues, um, uh, the Brahma Vihara's practice of being aware of the Brahma Vihara's, the whole point of the practice is to extend it out, to push it further and further until it includes all living beings. And that's hard to do. It takes constant attention, awareness, practice. Heard a story, I was looking for an illustration of this, of illustration of application of the Brahma Viharas in everyday life. And I came across a story that at first I thought, oh, I was, but it just, as I, more I thought about it, the deeper it became. There are two women and they live next to each other. One is a mother of four children, it's very busy. The other one is a retired one, an elder person. And the mother is very much more sort of traditional and conservative in her politics and rather active. And she can tell just by signage on the, on the lawns during election time that the elder woman is not one of the, the conservatives. And also she, something about the, the congregation that she attends. Right? And every day they go walking. The two of them both like to walk. That's part of their, their daily routine is to be healthy and get those steps in. And they always said hi to each other politely. But then one day the young woman is going out on her walk. The kids are off at school. She's go, about to go on the walk and she sees the other woman sitting on a chair on the porch. And she says, just something hits her. She can tell there's something different, something wrong. And she just says, are you going walking today? And the, the older woman said, I fell and I feel really vulnerable. I don't feel steady enough or safe enough to walk. And the woman said, the young woman suddenly says, well, I could walk with you today at least. You could take my arm and you could walk and I could walk and we'd both be safe together. They didn't reconcile their politics. They didn't even talk about politics. They didn't talk about religion, but there was something about compassion, something about joy, something about loving kindness that was present in their lives came awoke up in their lives and in all their families' lives and in all the lives that, 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 that was touched by their lives. It was a small moment. It's not gonna decide who becomes president in November, but it changed 
something about how they understood the world, about who they were, and what it meant to be good in this life. There was a, a woman named Ann Herbert who wrote handy tips on how to behave at the, at the death of the world. She wrote this in 1995. How then shall we live? The world is coming to an end. Falling in love is appropriate for now. To love all these things which are about to leave, the rocks are watching, and the squirrels, and the stars, and the tired people in the street. If you love them, let them know with grace and non-invasive extravagance. Care about the beings that you care about in gorgeous and surprising ways. Color outside the lines, she said. Practice random kindness and senseless acts of beauty. This is your last chance. So to be good, practice random acts of kindness and senseless, senseless beauty. Now we'll listen to the song, If I Needed, to, Needed You, by Towns Van Zandt, performed by Sarah and Owen. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and give a benediction. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is at the end of my sermon, I was supposed to include the end of David Pyle's story. The Reverend Pyle, who was trying to buy a car, he finally, the day came, he drove into the church, the church parking lot in a smart car. And within a year, three people had also bought smart cars and he realized he'd started a new religious. So. All right. But then these words as blessings to carry with us as we go out into the world. For the sun and the dawn, which we did not create. For the moon and the evening, which we did not make for food which we plant but cannot grow, for friends and loved ones we have not earned and cannot buy, for this gathered company which welcomes us as we are from wherever we have come, for all the free communities that keep us human and encourage us in our quest for beauty, truth, and love, for all the things which come to us as gifts of being from sources beyond ourselves, gifts of life and love and friendship. We lift up our hearts and thanks this day. May we thank the universe for all of these things in the days to come. Amen. And now we extinguish our chalice. Please join in saying our traditional words and the words printed on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Amen. And now let's form our circle.